every episode there seems to be a song which I blatantly favour over the others. So here we are just in time to do that again. This week that song is Get On The Right Thing. Because I listen to Red Rose Speedway all the way through in one go on the bus to work once and I distinctly remember feeling that there was only one song that was really drawing me back for more very much like Bitbop on the last episode Get On The Right Thing was sufficient enough for me to give the whole album another go now I mentioned this on the last episode but I really feel like this will be the second to last chance I will get to properly bring up Ram in earnest so I'll revel in it whilst I can this song was not written or recorded during the Red Rose Speedway sessions like the best song on Wildlife this song's roots of course begin during the phenomenal Ram sessions the story goes that after a difficult production of the song Paul stumbled across the unused tape whilst prepping for Red Rose Speedway but he still thought it was pretty unusable or at least wanted to change the vocal However, it was Denny Lane who eventually persuaded Paul to use the track on the album because of its up-tempo, mass-market appeal. Lane said, But it's great. I love it. If you change the vocal, though, it won't be as strong. The track has all the hallmarks of a fantastic Ram song. Stellar production, a raw, wild sense of emotive chaos, an uncontrollable energy, inventive melodies, and creative studio wizardry on the mix. All this and more go towards helping Get On The Right Thing to boldly stand out amongst the rest of its Red Rose Speedway kin, which definitely seemed to be lacking something special that made the Ram sessions just so electric. The moment the first piano coda comes menacingly into the picture, you start to get that familiar Ram feeling where you know that you're in for something special. One of the first Ram telltale signs of the song is that the song is very aware about not blowing its load too soon. We are doled out slowly these powerful melodramatic smackings of the piano keys that hint at a hidden but imminent approaching force. Then we have that thudding, lolloping bass that slyly builds up over ever increasing tensions. And then and then it seemingly releases that tension. We get a rather pleasant little McCartney howl and he even sings what we would think is the chorus twice. So you may be thinking it wasn't worth all that sexy build up to begin with. All this has been done in a purposely downbeat manner to make the actual chorus come out barreling twice as hard. It's been a ruse. This structure of verse verse chorus and is just as satisfying in its own way because it has a bit more class to the song and is very telling that it isn't just any old Red Rose Speedway track as this structure gives it a bit more subtlety and guile to it than the rest. It's definitely an episodic song meaning that whilst it does feel like one cohesive narrative with the beginning middle and end it's still made up of several separate elements that are seamlessly brought together. Now this isn't to the extent of something like Uncle Albert, but the same principles apply. But that chorus, wow, that did get me interested. And after I'd listened to the album back the whole way through for the first time, it was this song that I came straight back to, and because of, yes, that fantastic explosion of a chorus. And it's something else. The sheer excitability of this track is unparalleled on this album. It is the zenith of high-octane, sing-along, rocking out with mass market appeal that Red Rose Speedway was always trying to be. It's just a shame that the rest of the album isn't at all this good. Vocally on this track we find McCartney letting loose and seemingly having more fun than he does on the rest of the album in one of his fantastic little Little Richard nods. And this is one of the very last times he'll do this to my memory. He flits wider between ascending into this frantic howl then whooping and calling all the way back down to serve the almighty chorus to fit it in all over and over. He delivers an almost gospel level of exuberance in his delivery. Though, in a song that's essentially about love, it's never hard for Paul to be this passionate. It's just a shame that he never sings like this anymore, really. Now, at this point in their career, the backing vocals in the band are typically handled by both Elaine and Linda. But, until I was aware of this song's Ram heritage, I was pretty sure that I could hear them both. However, you know, following the timelines, it's very apparent that Linda alone would have been the one handling these duties. And wow, does she knock it out of the park on this one. The way she belts out in a howling falsetto get on the right thing was the first thing on on the album that really caught me firmly held me and was responsible for getting me to come back it's just joyously infectious isn't it it challenges you not to sing along to it i challenge you not to sing along to it in terms of linda backing vocals i was initially going to write about how four albums in she had already found her niche in the band's vocals but yeah she was kicking ass from the second one 
so many of the musical elements come together in this song, it's astounding. And I mean, it's not even that complicated of a song. Just that for such a rowdy track to be so precise and well produced is always remarkable in itself. There's that great banging piano throughout where you can really feel the force behind each. Wah! You can really tell that he's in his showman mode with his kind of playing, and I love it. We also have that slick and focused McCartney bass line that helps keep up the momentum of such a runaway track. The drums are a great return for me for that wild and crazy Denny saw that I was so enraptured with from the Ram sessions. And also these great little claps that really send off the song too. I remember last time I couldn't quite remember the name of the non-humor Kraken guitarist on Ram and I am here now to rectify that because oddly enough it was in fact session guitarist Dave Spinoza who did the guitar work for this song. I know he wasn't my favorite of the two guitarists on Ram but I never said he was bad and on here he really shines through. Two albums and two years later, it, this is easily the best song Spinoza worked on, but not the most distinctive in terms of his identity on McCartney vinyl, as I could have easily just assumed it was McCullough or Lane if not told otherwise. However, it still has that same kind of twisty and off-kilter style, which is perfect for this song. Another interesting piece of guitar play on this song is the inclusion of some backwards guitar loops. Now, obviously, a lot of things that anyone who follows this podcast is well aware that the Beatles kind of pioneered the backwards guitar part on songs like Rain, I'm Only Sleeping, and Tomorrow Never Knows. So Paul would be more than familiar with both how to achieve the effect and how to suitably utilise it in a song. Whilst used rather sparingly, its inclusion in the track is indicative of the playful experimentation and studio mastery within the Ram sessions. It harkens back to the otherworldly nature of the album and it gives the song a mysterious edge. Lyrically, the song is the best kind of throwaway there is. It's harmless, but not because it's on a safe and sappy album, but just because it's trying to be fun. There are a few nice little lines here, like... Your world is as kind as a penny, and your cloud disappears into yellow, which are just some very nice enigmatically evocative images in their own way. Though I must say, the in the rather like the um, the line from the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. You've got the equally succinct, tried and, and true message of try a little love, you can't go wrong, which I can totally get behind. But the lyrics are just a framework to get up to the chorus. Now, this song could potentially suffer from what I'm. McCartney's most stereotypical issues which is of course his seeming inability to write a proper or should I say concise and simple ending to a song. Get on the right thing seems to be drawn to a close at least three times at the 310, 322 and 343 marks only to rouse itself once more. As I mentioned already on several songs like Monkberry Moon Delight or The Backseat of My Car both interestingly from Ram. Also, that this overindulgence is rarely a problem for me, but it does seem to be a little more blatant in this song. Though at this point, I think I've sung this song's graces enough for you to know that, you know, a quibble like this really isn't going to derail my love for the song. Despite the fact that I do rather like the two previous songs on Red Rose Speedway, what's damning is the fact that Red Rose Speedway still feels like a complete breath of fresh air by comparison. Basically, what I'm saying is, is that Ram is so good that it actually damages Red Bro Speedway. After being borrowed from Ram in the way it was, it allowed Paul to donate one hell of a fist-pumpingly good tune and an unexpectedly hard rocker in the way that Paul McCartney fans may not have suspected after wading through the gauzy web of strings on My Love. It's a fantastic song. It's a song that will still have me coming back for more, and I will always love it. The next song is one of the songs I like to call Enjoyably Bland. It's one of the safe white bread songs, but you can't really accuse Paul of producing something bad, but you can't ever see yourself like recommending it to anyone. I mean, it's the pure definition of beige, and it couldn't be more by the numbers McCartney if it tried. This is One More Kiss. I didn't mean to hurt you, little girl. Let's make it one to remember. Only one more kiss. So maybe I'm being a little bit too quick to be harsh on this harmless little number. It's certainly not offensive, but I can't call it good on any sort of scale. It's just that it painfully follows the formula to the letter, which you know isn't always a bad thing, but it has the impression that McCartney really isn't trying all too hard on this one. Maybe he's a little bit too stoned, I don't know. And coming in just after three pretty stellar tracks, the cracks start to appear in the album. When Rolling Stone said that Paul's granddad would like this album, or when Lennon accused McCartney of making Granny Muzak, this is exactly what they were on about. The Beatles used to be tent poles of counterculture. You know, they did drugs, had long hair, wore crazy clothes, and were always trying to subvert the system. 
Now we're not only three years after the band's breakup, and now we're drenched in overt sentimentality. But not that kind of cute, resonant sentimentality that touches upon something that we can all relate to. It's just Paul being mushy for mushiness's sake. So, after saying that, you might be surprised to hear that in parts, that lyrically, at least, I find this song to be almost enjoyably relatable. Purely just from lines like, I said a foolish thing last night, I didn't think you'd take it bad. Clearly it's an attempt at some sort of uh, reconciliatory song between him and Linda after some little tiff the couple may have had, and who hasn't been in that kind of situation before. Oddly enough, I find it refreshingly frank and well phrased, in the way that someone actually might be speaking. Obviously Paul keeps the nature of this argument intentionally ambiguous as it lends itself to several interpretations, especially with lines like, just before I go and I must be on my way, is he literally leaving for good and never coming back, or is he just off to work? And we're just like a quick kiss before he goes. Whichever version you hear when you listen to this song, which again depends entirely on where you are in your own life and what kind of mood you're in, lends the song a different emotional residence and credence in its own right. It's little stuff like this where Paul can use seemingly throwaway lines, and believe me this album has a lot of throwaway lines, but it can have a different effect on different people in different ways. That keeps many more of his obviously generic songs from being anything close to something terrible. And whilst in my own biased way, I do see some actual charms buried amidst the mundane poo of this song. It's obvious that One More Kiss dredges up the most accurate representation of people's most negative opinions of not only Paul's songwriting, but also his musicality. This song has that pitifully dull and safe McCartney acoustic sound. It has none of the heart of something like junk, and it has none of the raw emotion of something like Every Night. This sound just takes away any hope of edge that this song may have had. Though weirdly, I'm not sure how to explain this, but the song is neither too light nor too unheavy. It just kind of exists as a song that fills the album and follows some Wikipedia guide on, on how to write a song that will appeal to the parents of the kids who are going to buy the album. It also features the dreariest contribution from Deli Sewell on a Paul McCartney record to date, and any trace of the Ram Madman that I became so fond of originally has gone without a trace. He literally may well have been replaced by a drum machine. However, one highlight in particular on this song is Henry McCullough's guitar work. It stood out to me right away in my right ear and cut through the bland mix of the production and, you know, it turned out to be quite an entertaining and enjoyable section. I remember when I first heard this track being immediately drawn to that spaced out yet jagged and growling quality he brings to the composition as a whole. The main chorus once again utilises the repetitive format of drilling those words into your brain, not so much as to trick you into thinking you like the song, but it makes damn sure that you won't forget it. And the sad truth of the matter is that Paul writes some pretty incredibly catchy choruses. This is definitely an autorial song through and through. The sense of McCartney's authorship is painfully present as you come to realise that songs like this will always worm their sordid way into McCartney's albums till the end of time. And in that sense, I can see why this song would stand out on an album like Red Rose Speedway. Wasn't this supposed to be the commercial giant that was going to appeal to all audiences? And yeah, I could see how Paul could reason with himself that this middle-of-the-road track would do just that, but it's almost too middle-of-the-road for anyone to truly connect with, and therefore fails to make any lasting impression. It's definitely one of those, kind of like it when I listen to the album as a whole, type songs. As I've said with many songs in the past, I feel that purely on this authorial sense that McCartney, for better or worse, still achieved what he set out to do, but this is a big but. As with his Beatles career, he can tend to be rather hit and miss with his ability to discern between when it is and is not appropriate to include these Muzak homages to days gone by, and this is a full-on miss. One More Kiss is essentially a song written by McCartney to piss off the critics of his Muzak, and he does so with a deft master stroke. So on the last album, Paul, in broad strokes, lamented the loss of nature on the title track of the album. But on Red Rose Speedway, Paul will convey his experiences of loss in the animal kingdom in a much more personal and singular level. This is Little Lamb Dragonfly. Now, I was always intending to give Little Lamb Dragonfly a pretty damn good review, there was no question of that. However, in my research for the show, I suddenly realised that this song had a much greater significance to this story, and its stark quality as an emotional and stirring song could simply be explained by one little factoid that, until I began researching this episode, I simply did not know. Little Lamb Dragonfly is a goddamn ram song. Dragonfly Fly by my window was 
originally slated um, for the abandoned and untitled Rupert the Bear project, but was brought back for Red Rose Speedway. And unlike Get On The Right Thing, which uses the original recording and just it's popped on the Red Rose Speedway album, this song was re-recorded in full with the contemporary Wings lineup. then. In the grand old spirit of Ram, McCartney delivers a perfectly suitably powerful and tangible vocal performance and injects that spirit right into the Red Rose Speedway studio environment and it really pays off. This goes for the track as a whole really which benefits greatly from this atypical creativity from the inventive structure, lush instrumentation and its near immaculate production. Paul went on to say, this is the first of the songs on the album that explicitly deals with the theme of loneliness. It seems like an odd topic for Paul at this juncture in his life, especially when you consider that he's surrounded by his new bandmates, and including his wife no less. However, this was written during the turbulent Ram sessions, so he's dredging up all of those old emotions. And the Lamb sections that kind of bookend the song are pretty self-explanatory. They were inspired by a horrific moment in McCartney's life when a lamb helplessly died on his farm one night. It was early one morning, and I brought my guitar and I thought, I couldn't have done anything for this little lamb, so I started singing... I have no answer for you, little lamb. Now, the feeling of helplessness in itself is a lonely one. That lamb died all alone and no one could help it. McCartney probably related to those feelings. He had just lost his band and felt very cut off from his bandmates, especially because of all the legal troubles at the time. It was a painfully sad moment. The dragonfly sections do almost sound like they're going to shift into a more uplifting mode, but it's rather deceptive in its musical choices. McCartney almost feels glad that the dragonfly itself can be free and fly away, but he himself is weighed down by the melancholy that he knows that he can't and is stuck. Denny Sewell went on to say, We had recorded the song during Ram, but it wasn't finished. One day we were, we, one day we were over at Trident Studios. Paul was sitting at the piano and he, and he was saying, I never really finished this. So I helped him finish it a little bit, but I wouldn't call it co-writing, but I wrote some of the background harmonies. Danny, Danny Lane's partner, Jojo Lane, who we talked about earlier in this episode, went on to say, It was the most exciting wing session I was ever involved in. The words were so moving that I started crying. So Denny and all the others turned to me and the words became, She's crying, the little girl's crying. The opening group vocals, the I have no answer for you little lamb part, are absolutely sublime. Though I must admit that originally I thought it was just Denny Lane singing, as it's such a stark shift in the vocals that wing have delivered up until this point. They're some of, if not my favourite vocals on the whole album, and it showcases the band's capabilities and what they can do as a whole. This is most apparent as we know the atmosphere within the band was anything but gentle, unified and peaceful, despite what makes it onto the record. Then, very much like the structure for Love is Strange, McCartney's first solo vocals by proxy have felt absent, and when they come soaring in after the group, the effect is possibly the most powerful dose of true pathos on the entire album. You know, McCartney's obviously the strongest vocal presence in the band, And he takes over the lead with such assurance and confidence that the very deep and personable emotions can be felt all the more accurately. Which is impressive as he never actually goes into the detail in the lyrics as to the specific tragic incident that inspired the song. Paul's vocals harken back to the emotional depth of tracks like Wildlife and Dear Friend. He reaches these fantastic peak crescendos that can easily feel the agony he was going through at the time of writing. Despite the fact that the event took place two years ago, when Paul sings those bits where he goes like, since you've gone, I never know, I go on, but I miss you so, but I feel the pain keeps coming back again, it literally gets me every time that I hear it. It so brilliantly makes you think of every, every time you were lonely, every time you felt down, and it connects with those emotional strands in a way that oh so few songs do. The call and response vocals from the whole band are also very emotional. Musically, this is also one of the most majestic and subtle on the album. As, you know, it is it is as good as anything on Ram, though nowhere near as obviously showy as anything on that album. As I've mentioned before on the last episode, I always felt like this song had a kind of a classico, almost medieval type feel to it, mostly due to the succulent 12-string acoustic guitar that opens up the track. Unlike on Get On The Right Thing, which used the original Ram session tapes, like I said, McCullough manages to make an impression on the Ram legacy and make his presence in the song very noticeable, albeit in a very non-showy yet whimsical way. His understated solo, if anything, sounds incredibly Beatlesque in both its composition and execution. No pun intended, but Little Lamb Dragonfly will always be the black sheep of Red Rose Speedway, as it rises above the ambivalence of silly love songs to create a genuinely touching and effective piece of songwriting. It ditches the commercial throwaway nature that pervades the whole exercise, 
and replaces it with a real sense of grandeur and sure-footed confidence that allows it to transcend its surroundings. On to side two now, and there's probably a song on an album that you'll never quite expect to be of any importance to you as a person, a song that, because of happenstance or a random occurrence in its relationship to your life, you'll be forever attached to. And for Red Rose Speedway, it's Single Pigeon. Single seagull gliding over Regent's Park Canal. Do you need a pal for a minute or two? You do. Me too. Me too. Me too. Basically, my wonderful girlfriend, my partner, my other half, absolutely loves pigeons. I should point out right now that she likes fat wood pigeons, not dirty town pigeons, but I digress. So by the mere name of this song, I decided to pop it on for her one night, and no sooner had she fallen in love with the song's basic charms, I had also taken a similar affinity. Though when I first heard the track, I simply kind of glossed it over without taking too much of a second thought. But when you hear a song again in a new context, it opens up a whole new listing experiences for you. The song Holy is the best representation of what a lightweight McCartney ditty should sound like. Almost all the negative things that I said about One More Kiss, or that I will say about When the Night, could be applied to Single Pigeon, admittedly, but they would all be positives. It's something I would want as a listener from a good old-fashioned McCartney Family Hour pub tune. But why is it different? Well, to be honest, the answer is pretty simple, and it's in the production of the song. For the majority of the track, it's literally just Paul at the piano singing along. The simplicity of the track gives it an earnestness that more complex productions would eventually lose. The fact that it's just us, Paul and the piano, without any bells and whistles, means that we can view the song for what it is without any confusion. This is not meant to be in the new Hey Jude, nor is it meant to be taken as such. Paul is just giving us a delightful little number for the sheer fun of making music and singing songs. The lack of frills also mean that the emotions can be more clearly presented to us as listeners. And whilst this is short, sweet and simple, like any McCartney track, there is always some deep-seated emotion, even if it's a little hard to spot at first. The track is also the opener for side two, and I find its placement very intentional. It signifies a shift in the album whereby we've had a, a series of mostly knockout McCartney tunes, but now we are definitely onto the less focused half of the album. Now we have what was a pretty solid rock album, shifting into what's essentially the McCartney at the piano offcuts of the album. The song is totally innocent, gentle and pure, meaning it can nestle comfortably in the golden side of the stereotypically McCartney category. The melody itself is just perfect for me, it really is. It has that quirky charm whereby you can just feel the McCartneyness of its cadence just running through your bones. It's a very warm and homely type tune that harkens back to an England that may not even have existed back then, and definitely does not exist now. I'm always happy whenever I know that McCartney is sat in front of those black and white keys, as I feel like it's where he's most at home. It's a song that I can imagine people sitting around a piano and actually singing together. Later, other elements are then brought into the song like a bit of whimsical acoustic and moody background bass, but they are subtle and do not interfere with the core of the song and support it perfectly from the sidelines. It's quaint and inoffensive in the best way. It's another song on this album, and the second in a row, where McCartney will muse over the idea of loneliness. Like Little and Dragonfly, he associates and compares himself to a flying animal. It's obviously a very powerful symbol for him of freedom and defiance that obviously resonated enough for him to recycle it several years later. And fortunately, both songs are unique enough and different enough from each other for the idea not, not to feel overused, just. The loneliness, however, is based more on feeling lonely despite the fact that you are with someone. In the song, Paul has been sent away and likens himself to the solitary birds he sees around himself. Yes, they are free, but at what cost? The way he expresses to the lonesome bird an offer of friendship is so endearingly tragic as you know that he's so desperate to find someone, something, to be with just so he doesn't feel alone. We know the bird probably doesn't feel lonely, and he's just projecting what he's feeling so that he doesn't seem so hopeless. He then admits that he is indeed the one who needs a pal for a minute or two, and that they are in fact more alike than they know. Perhaps he wishes he could feel nothing like, like the bird does, but he also loves to feel, so it's easy to make the bird the one who is wanting, and he is the one offering comfort to the needy. It's so raw and expressive, and it's always so warming to see McCartney in these moments of vulnerability, especially in such a cute little ditty like this. 
Linda's backing vocals, as always, are so very sweet and retains a lot of the beauty of something like I Am Your Singer without making it a duet. These are very soft and sweeping backing vocals that blend so wonderfully without taking away from the power of the message about loneliness, but also hints at the idea that you may indeed always have someone who actually cares about you even if you can't see them. The Uncle Albert horns at the end are a nice little finisher to make sure the song doesn't end on the exact same point it began, but it definitely feels a little tacked on. It's admittedly very lush and adds to the classico British feel that is present throughout the song though. Coming in at 1 minute 53 seconds, it's the shortest track on the entire album, which works to its advantage. The fact that it's so brief and chipper that any attempt to make it longer would make it lose that, that charm. So yeah, Single Pigeon, it may not be a good wing song, but it's a phenomenal Paul McCartney piano ballad. One that will always hold dear to my heart for obviously biased ass reasons. And I simply don't care. The next track is basically the song that I either sometimes feel like I have to sit through to get the full Red Rose Speedway experience, or the song that wasn't as bad as I remember the last time I heard it. Now again, I always feel awkward on this show leaping to words like bad to describe a song, but I can for sure say that on the whole that this is not a song I enjoy listening to. This is When the Night. I remember listening to this song for the first time and to this day I can oh so tangibly remember the exact thought process I was going through when I was listening to it. I was sat there watching the cards go by and I heard Paul singing in those luscious tones, the night was beautiful and mellow. And I knew Paul would not be able to help himself but instinctively ensure that the next word would be a rhyming word that would indeed be fellow. And I was right. I called it. Now, I'm not saying I'm any sort of songwriting expert, but come on, this is basically the exact same issue we had with Wild Things Tomorrow, and you know, he rhymed it with sorrow, whereby I feel like it's almost a first draft to writing some of these lyrics. It's well known with Paul, along with many other songwriters, would plunk a lyric in place when writing a song in order to keep the cadence before the final lyric could be crafted. These placeholder lyrics are invaluable in songwriting, but are normally swiftly ditched for a more complex, subtle, or unique line to spice things up. Well, unfortunately here it would seem that Paul all too frequently would keep to this first impulse lyric. Especially in things like uh, the leaping armadillo line in Big Barn Bed, Paul was not even bothering to replace these placeholder lyrics. Or at least, and most importantly, it just feels that way. In analysing the song, I really have been trying to find elements of the, the lyrics that I do like, but every time I look at them, I'm almost gobsmacked by their generic mediocrity. Now, yeah, you can say not all of Paul's songs are going to be Eleanor Rigby and plumb the depth of the human condition, but really, Paul, wow, does this song go nowhere fast. Yes, there was a great night, and a girl showed you some things you'd never seen before, and... What do you mean, that's it? This is the bare bones of a Paul McCartney song. It's not even a, a cheesy gimmick to go along with it. It's just an endless stream of love song cliches and doesn't even lend itself to multiple listens. If there was one song on this album that lends itself to the theory that Paul was probably too stoned to know what he was doing, it would indeed be this song. There's a certain that'll do for now feel to the whole shebang. And the song fundamentally does not feel like Paul or Wings as a whole for that matter or on top of their game at all. It's just yet another love song I mean, come on Paul, is there literally no grit on this whole half of the album? Yes, Single Pigeon was a lovely addition that provides a little levity, but come on man, you're really going to need to start pulling out some of the heavier guns here. Now, <laughs> you can definitely start to see why Henry McCullough was disappointed with the final product of Red Road Speedway. This song is the most dull and tedious of the lot, and really clashes with their cool, rocking onstage persona. It's like Paul has brought in these two famously blues adept guitarists, he knows what they can do, and still he has them working as backing men on endlessly plain, kosher, lovey-dovey songs, and playing the medley for solos. It very much comes off like, like this whole album. Wasted potential. I do like the piano at the start, and I do like the bounce of the song as it progresses. I'm also a fan of that wonderfully illustrious Latin-style guitar that I would never expect to hear from either Lane or McCullough. And McCartney's vocals, as the song goes on and progresses, does 
get a little more powerful and rousing. It's some top-notch screaming and its gruffness is sorely missed on the rest of the album and is woefully misplaced on such a soft, tedious number as this. He does give us a charming performance, but it's it's a charm that I'm uneasy with. Like, I'm not too comfortable with what Paul's trying to convince me here. And if he's trying to convince me that this song is good, it's definitely a sort of predatory behaviour that I'm not comfortable with. Sadly, the things that I do like about this song are few and far between. Overall, it's an attempt to reach everyone, but will ultimately reach no one. When you consider that songs like The Mess, Night Out, or Soily, or Jazz Street never made it onto this album, only to make way for a humdrum song like this will forever be a source of tremendous irritation for me. And hopefully for you people out there, it's also a source of irritation for you too. It's a misstep extraordinaire. Rolling Stone's website, in doing a clickbait top 10 of Paul McCartney's instrumental songs, in the vein of mm, kind of what I am doing now with the blog, mind you, described this song as a trippy instrumental suite that feels like a man drowning in an ocean after midnight with only a bass line to save him. If I knew my life was in the hands of a Paul McCartney bass line, I know I'd be in safe hands. This is Loop, first Indian on the moon. for a fact that most people are either entirely indifferent towards this song or simply relegated to a song that sounds pretty good in the background when you're stoned. And I'm here to tell you that, yes, the last part is true, but it also sounds pretty damn good when you're sober as well. No, honestly, it does. This is not a McCartney 1 in instrumental that I'm putting a rag on. This, this actually has a bit of inventiveness to it. Now, for you eagle-eared fans out there, you'll probably notice that loop first in On The Moon really does not feel like a McCartney song or a wing song. So where does this radical change come from? That was, you know, and why is this on the commercial Wings album? Basically, at the time Wings were recording Red Rose Speedway at Abbey Road with their studio engineer extraordinaire Alan Parsons, there was another band recording their album at Abbey Road with studio engineer extraordinaire Alan Parsons. This was a little band called Pink Floyd and they were working on a little known album titled Dark Sign of the Moon. Now, I do need to preface this by saying Yes, I'm a music fan, a vinyl hipster with a beard, who wishes he was one in the 50s, and I haven't heard Dark Side of the Moon in full. Yes, it's a big gap in my music knowledge, but luckily, through trusted contacts and the general osmosis of music and culture, means that I know enough to blag this section. And it's clear that the technophile studio withdrew of prog rock was a massive influence on this song. Perhaps it's similar to when Paul wanted to top the Beach Boys with Back in the USSR. Now he wants to top Pink Floyd at their own game too. However, the endlessly divulgent Danny Sewell lends another perspective about this song's roots. Paul said he crafted this song thinking that to him, this is what jazz was. Now, regardless to where this song came from, is it any good? It depends. Yes, this is the first McCartney instrumental he has given us since the disastrous quadruple fuck-up that was the instrumentals on McCartney 1. Quintuple if you include sing-along junk as well. So I know expectations aren't exactly high for this song, but let me tell you, it's far more interesting than any of those songs combined, because it's not just Paul playing on them. More so than any other song on the album, this instrumental, whether true or not, certainly has the feeling that the band as a whole are given much more room by McCartney to let loose and do their thing uninhibited. In this context, the song's loose feel works very well, and it feels like the band came together as a real group of musicians with their own styles and sensibilities, jam, and see what comes out on the other side of the intergalactic wormhole. On the whole, Lou, Loop, or Lou, as, a, as I've heard some people call it, the first Indian on the moon, for a song that thematically does not take place on Earth, has a suitably otherworldly feel to it. And since there are no words to describe the quote-unquote story, it is left up to your imagination to decipher what who Loop Lou is and what his journey is, but I'll do my best to give you my own conjecture of how the song thematically feels. It opens with that very ethereal tribal quality, the chorus of shamanic chanting really kicks off the song in a deceptively intense way as you feel the relentless momentum really starting to run away with you. This is what I perceive as the rocket launch segment of the song, 
and you so tangibly feel the sense of direction and destination and power behind the composition, you are already strapped in on the ride and it's too late to get off. Then, out of nowhere, all of a sudden, things quiet down. We have a lull. This is the wonderful transition to a really, to a real moment of serenity on this album. We move into the obviously Alan Parsons section of the song. The concept of the song is taken to its very literal peak now that we are out in space. The music kind of dies down to the, to the background as we float weightlessly through space. And there's literally nothing to be heard except the sounds of the ship and the sound of the ever-expansive blackness. The keyboard and theremin, as cheesy and as corny as they may sound to some people, perfectly encapsulate this sense of space travel. Then we have a sudden surge of energy. We are back on the move. Pat's loop has spotted the moon. Thrusters have been primed and we are ready for landing. I really feel the momentum of this whole track is now throwing us forward once again. And when the chanting starts up again, we are truly on alien atmosphere. But it reprises the feelings that we had back on Earth. So perhaps the chanting re- represents being on hard ground with its earthy tones. He has landed on the moon. He, this is new territory for us to discover. Unfortunately, this thematically isn't uh, consistent with the album. The album itself does not tread much new ground. I mean, could you imagine if much more of the album had sounded like this? I don't know whether it would have been received better or worse, but at least it would have been different and and taken a bit more of a risk. Overall, you know, it's a fun enough track. It's inventive as it is silly, and it also has this layer of majesty to it. But unfortunately, its placement on the album doesn't do anything in its favour. Being smushed between the flaccid when the night and the Marmite medley means that it's well and truly sat amongst the flabbier part of the album. And like so many songs on this half, I have no idea why they were chosen over others. And as much as I like Loop, the first Indian on the moon, it still isn't a must by any stretch of the imagination. It's good for a B-side though. I feel that Loop, the first Indian on the moon, is kind of composed to have a video to it. Like, it definitely has a certain soundtrack quality to it. Um, I feel that it would be much more enhanced by having compelling visuals to it. I'm not saying you should put Loop the First Indian on the moon and run it with The Wizard of Oz or anything, but it definitely uh, evokes a very visual reception from the listener. And the parts where it has moments of serenity and parts where it's incredibly tense would work very, very well with its soundscape. And I feel a a video or just some sort of visual accompaniment would help tell the story of Loop, the first Indian on the moon, much more effectively. The last track on this album is not one track, but four tracks. This is the Red Rose Speedway medley. Paul McCartney is by no means a stranger to the end of an album, let's throw the balls to the wall medley. I'm sure you listeners will be more than familiar with the Titanic Abbey Road medley, which was, too, just an excuse to conjoin at their hip a hodgepodge series of of half-finished vignettes into a cohesive piece of music, all tied together through several thematic callbacks and unifying medleys. Now, straight up, I'm not going to bullshit you here, this is no Abbey Road medley. But on the same note, Wings was never the Beatles, so I have different standards and expectations for their separate outputs. Now, whereas the Abbey Road medley was much more of a last hurrah for the Fab Four lads, This medley seems to be much more of an attempt to scramble around and find some way of ending this frustratingly awkward album. Now, unlike the Abbey Road version, the four songs that were included on the Red Rose Speedway medley were all written by one person and were all written during the session. So they weren't like brought back with a certain sense of nostalgia. They all seem to be kind of not written with the expressed intention of them being used in a medley, but they all seem to have the same brevity and lightness that would facilitate them to be included as such. They were never uh, a part of the unreleased original double album, and at a first glance it seems so amusing as why it exists in lieu of simply putting one of the 10,000 songs that never made it onto the album instead. Is the medley better than The Mess, or Night Out, or Jazz Street, or Soily? Definitely not. So it's, again, it's, 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 it's just confusing the whole production of this album really. It's more likely than not that the medley was created as a reaction by Paul to EMI refusing to release Red Rose Speedway in its original double album format. Is this Paul, again, simply not knowing how to solve a new problem without applying an old Beatles answer? Or perhaps is it him trying to clear the slate of Red Rose Speedway? Trying to strip it down in the best way possible and exercising the demons of the studio experience by creating something new, fresh and quick to top things off? It does seem to be a very similar attempt at recreating the genius that was collating a bunch of unfinished songs and giving them new life. As Denny Saul said, Paul got these songs that he'd liked but they weren't really finished. 
We recorded the track separately and then they were mixed by Glyn Johns. Basically for this section I'm going to review each of the songs on its own merit quickly and then kind of come together at the end to look at the whole piece as a whole to see if it's better as one unit or the sum of its parts. Hold me tight. I've waited all my life for you Hold me tight Take care of me and I'll be right Hold me tight Hold me tight When I first saw this song on the track list I was very excited to hear him have the balls to do a Beatles cover on his new Wings album But we got this track instead no matter though, as Hold Me Tight is a perfectly serviceable part of this kind of melody, it does kick things off with a nice little jaunty sway where you you know bop along to it merrily enough. And I do find myself regularly being incredibly naive and apologistic and, and simply going along for the saccharine ride that it is. But the truth is that this song really doesn't hold up to any sort of long-term scrutiny. The piano intro to me also sounds dangerously similar to the opening of Maybe I'm Amazed as well. And one of the main negative aspects of the whole medley, really, is that despite the Wings' reputation as a badass live rock group, it, it's that it's all clearly just built around McCartney at the piano on his own. I mean, a medley would have been at the perfect place to allow all the band members to take a real stab at adding something a little more diverse. I mean, if this had, had more of an electric guitar rock focus, this could have been a mainstay of their live performances. The reliance on piano is also another smoking gun that McCartney... Just, was just not collaborating, and that the whole album was in a rush at this point. It suffers from a, as does most of the medley, a severe case of lacklustre songwriting. I think that every single word that can possibly rhyme with tight is ultimately used in this song, and again it has that severe overuse of repeat the chorus to mask said lack of lyrics, which due to the nature of the medley could have been sidestepped either by making it shorter or by adding another song, anything. Come on, Paul, we know you could have whipped up another song in an afternoon. Once again, the guitarists of Wings are relegated to the land of playing the medley for the solo, which always leaves a sour taste in my mouth. Lazy Dynamite. Lazy Dynamite. From mediocre to just flat out meh for our first phase shift onto the second song of the medley. I do like this one, but fuck me, is it so clearly what people talk about when they mention the banality of Paul's writing at this time? I'm not sure whether it generally does have the most generic lyrics in the medley or whether it just feels that way. But when you have lines like, Do you know that inside there's a love you can't hide, so why do you fight that feeling in your heart? How can you do anything but roll your eyes at Tosh like that? Again, if the album wasn't chock-a-block with this kind of thing, then maybe it would be a bit more forgivable, but now it's just getting boring. Lazy Dynamite? More like lazy songwriting. One thing has to be said, though, about the whole medley, and on a song as mediocre as this, it feels like the best place to mention this is that the vocals, both lead and backing for the whole medley, are top-notch. And not just these are just good singers anyway. It's like they knew that the music wasn't up to standard, so they were going to make sure, they were going to make damn sure that it was at least sung perfectly, and it is. The same can be said for the production as a whole, really. Despite a general lack of George Martin, the production of these songs and the mixing by Glyn Johns is top-tier stuff, with Paul himself really coming into his own. We've seen from the past few episodes his growing abilities as a composer, arranger, producer, and without them, this would have definitely fallen flat on its face in an instant. The production of the medley, with its perfect use of layering, the way it blends four varied tracks differently and seamlessly, and arranges it in such a way where, you, where it actually does feel like a semi genuine journey, albeit a tried and tested one, is a, is the perfect mask that it needs to cover the fact that the four separate songs, for the most part, are not all that amazing. There's a very kooky little country flair in Lazy Dynamite, with Dan Elaine adding a bit of harmonica, but it's it, again, this is just surface veneer to, to distract you from an otherwise very bog standard piano tune. What I do like at the end of it is the do 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 little transition into the next song. It's wonderfully silly and doesn't take itself too seriously, which is what the medley like this really needed. Then we jump into Hands of Love and things start taking a turn for the better. 
be like the never so after you know two generically plinky plonky piano ballads from maca we shift gears into a wonderfully up-tempo and jivey section it has an actual sense of joy and that seems to be missing from the previous two and that's mostly down to the fact that it feels like more of a song from the band rather than just paul it's a very adolescent type of song rather like the backseat of my car and it delivers the same sort of youthful exuberance to the whole affair with an optimistic romp I like that it does attempt to shake things up by bringing an acoustic guitar sound into the mix. Not only does it create a different texture for us to absorb, but it just breaks up the monotony of the sound. There's some very fun faux trumpets from the backing vocals. They are totally winning, in my opinion, and again carries that light-hearted mood which separates it from the Abbey Road medley, which did admittedly take itself very seriously. The solo in this song is actually unique and is a massive improvement in that section but as is the same with anything non McCartney it's short but sweet. Denny Sewell on this record mentions Paul played ocarina, I played conga. We put some strange effects on those drums it was very funny to record. And last up we have Power Cut and this is easily my favourite song in, in the medley by far. <laughs> actually inspired by events during the Wings University tour, whereby prolonged Billy Elliot-esque minor strikes resulted in frequent losses in power all over the country. And the mood of the song evokes that wonderful sense of unity that a power cut would create. Like Single Pigeon, I picture a family huddled around a piano, only this time it's lit by a single candle. I do not have to try to like this song, it just comes oh so naturally, and that's because it's simple, it's to the point, and the medley is just so damn catchy. I'm glad Paul saved the best or last, as it allows the album to end on a sweeter note than maybe it ultimately deserves. It essentially takes all the bad elements of the album, turns them around and uses them properly to create something that's genuinely enjoyable to listen to. The repetition of Baby I Love You So is hypnotic, the sentimental lyrics seem like they come from somewhere genuine, not just a cliché, and the white bread sound is utilised perfectly with the addition of an adorable little xylophone solo. If anything, this song succeeds because it feels like one of the few moments on the album where its lack of edge is appropriately embraced and doesn't feel out of place because it's that kind of song and it fits, it's suitable. I love as the song is slowly building up to the McCartney Vogue, we have these incredibly sweet and inventive little flourishes on the bass that Macca inserts. They are oh so brief, but they are so lush to listen to as they bubble up to the surface. Very similarly, there's these little scattershot Guitars that flit around the song like a fairy. I love them. You know when someone says a book is very readable and it comes across as an obvious thing to say? Well, this song kind of works in the same way. It's very listenable. Then at the end we have the reprisals of all the signature tunes of all the previous songs with some in the forms of some callbacks, rock solos to the main riffs at the end of each song. They are formulaic, but they are ineffective, like I say, in the sense that you really feel like you've been and gone on a journey and you are now coming full circle. And that's the medley. As you may have heard from my individual reviews, it's hard to give a definite stamp on the whole experience because it, it it seems very random. Yes, it does flow, but it's not consistent and it has many varying degrees of highs and lows. But I don't know, I think I, c I can say I do enjoy the medley as a whole than I do its separate components. I remember talking to my friend Maurice, who uh, hopefully will be joining us on the show in, in a few months and we were talking about how originally I pretty much liked the whole album bar the medley but whether it's due to overexposure which has warped my impartiality as a critic whether I've simply seen it from a different angle I now cannot fully commit to saying that I don't like it I could dare say I probably like it a whole lot more than he does now it's not even one of those it's good just on the album type moments either as I purposely put this on my iPod yesterday as I did some hoovering around the house if anything it's a wonderfully cheesy way to spend a 12 minute period in fact, Red Rose Speedway is a wonderfully cheesy way to spend 45 minutes. Overall, this is not 
a bad album, but I don't find it hard to see why other people call it a bad album. It definitely has its charms and it definitely has its faults. What we learn from this album is that Paul is still taking risks and constantly changing his sound, albeit in small baby step ways, but to make sure that whilst he is also trying to please his audience, he's never trying to pander to them and ultimately bore himself in the studio whilst doing so. Also, I need to make a point about songwriting in this one before I go. I know, you know, I'm the vocal element here. I'm the one who's been doing all the bashing of things like When the Night and the Medley. But would it be impossible to consider that Paul may simply enjoy writing simple little songs and take a break from writing the next Eleanor Rigby every now and then? I mean, we know Paul never makes music he doesn't like and he has some pretty wide and far-reaching tastes. So what may be perceived as arrogant stoner writings may just be an attempt to strip things back and not complicate things. Perhaps he thought an album that was too heavy on themes and emotion would not be the breakout commercial hit that he desired. Overall, Red Rose Speedway was an album that I initially was not moved by at all. But after several re-listens and re-listens and re-listens, certain elements began to ultimately shine through. It's cute, it's endearing, it's impressive as, it, as it's a Paul kicking up his feet and just giving us some warm, fuzzy music. Nothing more, nothing less. It's not going to plumb the depths of the human spirit. But that being said, the significance and badassery of tracks like Get On The Right Thing and Little Lamb Dragonfly cannot be underestimated. Maybe Paul just needed to knuckle down and make something that would, instead of being a slow burner, create something that would be more likeable instantaneously. And I guess that leads us perfectly into our next episode. To wrap things up, we have a little feature here, simply titled Cannon Fodder, where I'll be attempting to pick the best of the best from these McCartney albums. So we know what's the fastest and quickest way to understand what's going on at any point in McCartney's career. This this will be a little journey, a little place of the essential songs you will need to know. We will then have the ultimate McCartney canon. And who knows, maybe this list in the future will be all people need to get interested in Macca. So what songs from Red Rose Speedway are are we going to be keeping today? I'm going to go with My Love because... Uh, essentially I am a slave to popular opinion to some extent and I'm a sucker for any Macca piano love ballad and if you end up resisting them you end up doing more damage to yourself anyway and I will always have that connection with this song on the Wings Greatest album as well which goes back many many years for me we're going to go for Little Lamb Dragonfly purely because never has a song gone so fast from my ambivalence pile to my classics pile simply after one re-listen it's easily the most inventive and stylish and luscious track on the album it's borderline perfection really and once again it it reinforces my ram biases speaking of ram biases we're also going to have get on the right thing of course we are because this is the song that proved how badass linda truly was and this song in many ways actually allowed this review to take place the way it did in the first place just resist that chorus And lastly, I'm going to throw in Single Pigeon, mostly because I love my girlfriend and she would murder me if I didn't put this onto the list. But in all seriousness, it's a very charming song. I simply couldn't resist. The moment I heard it, I knew this is going to be one I will remember forever. Thank you, folks. Thank you once again for listening to Paul or Nothing. I know this episode has been a long time coming. So long, in fact, that I've already written and recorded the next episode of Band on the Run. And I'll save my excuses, like I say, for that episode. I hope you're enjoying the show. I really feel like we've gotten a nice little groove here. Things feel far more natural all the time. And I can't wait to see where this show ends up going. And I'm, I'm just so thankful for all the support I've had thus far. You people know who you are. But after Bannon on the Run, I am going to be trying to have as many guests on the show as possible. So that should also be pretty damn fun too. Uh, The last bit of admin and I'll let you go. Please write to the show. Whether you disagree with anything I've said, if there's anything you think I've missed, whether you shared an acid trip with Paul or if you're the Ram from the cover of Ram or whether you simply like the show and wish to rub my tender ego, please contact us at paulmccartneypod at gmail.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Either look up Paul or Nothing or Paul McCartney Podcast. Give us a like, a comment. You know the drill. Please drop us an iTunes review. I cannot stress this enough with you people. If you really like the show and you want to help us out in some way, then please do do this this is the best way for us to get that exposure and last but not least by the time you hear this podcast our blog in its bare bones placeholder form is now likely to be up and running you can find all the episodes there as well as all in the future you'll be able to find all kinds of mccartney based articles that i'll be writing and that will be at www.paulmccartneypod.wordpress.com that's www.paulmccartneypod.wordpress.com 
Oh, okay, uh, I think I can hear the outro music playing already. Look, I've had a brilliant time talking about this album, folks. Please go back and revisit it. I, I certainly had fun doing so. I don't regret it. Look, just have fun. Stay safe. God bless, whatever. And keep listening to Paul McCartney, folks. See you next week.